Okay, how's that? Better? Okay, well, hello. <laughs> and happy Valentine's Day to all of you. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Now, uh, this, uh, this day, today, begins a, uh, a new series that we are launching about love. And so <clears throat> I'm just tickled that it happened to uh, coincide with Valentine's Day. I think that's something that the Lord is doing there. But anyway, you know, earlier this week, uh, Pastor Nandy and, and I uh, left out of town to do some, uh, some work with our, our movement, our denomination, or our movement. And uh, anyway, so we left for three days to go do that. And uh, first thing Monday morning, jumped on a plane out of here. And we ran like crazy preparing for that, sitting with the leaders of a different movement. And, and just, I mean, from sunup to well past sundown, you know, uh, having those series of meetings. And even though we were in the beautiful, sunny state of Florida, I don't think I got to see the sun, right? Because uh, we were just that busy. So anyway, I jumped back on a flight to come home Wednesday night. And uh, I get off that plane, and I was tired. I was just, like, kind of dragging and stuff. And so when I went down to the carousel to get my stuff, lo and behold, there is my youngest son, right? He's there to pick us up, and he has that warm smile and big hug that I needed. And so we took our luggage. You know, we jump in the car. Of course, he's driving, and Andy gets in the front, and I get in the back. Now, I'm very tired. I'm sitting there, and, of course, anybody will, you, if you have adult uh, children, you're going to get this one. So I begin to pray because he's driving, <laughs> you know. And uh, as we're going home, and I'm sitting back there and I'm praying, uh, Andy and uh, my son are talking, and so they're just dialoguing on all the things that have happened. And Andy's giving a synopsis, and then he says, "Hey, are you preaching this weekend, Dad?" And his dad goes, "Well, yeah, your mom and I are." And all of a sudden, he got quiet and he went, <clears throat> "Did you forget this weekend is Valentine's Day?" <laughs> And so now I perked up. I'm thinking, whoa, what's this being said, right? So, he get, you know, and he said, did you forget, Dad? And, and of course, Andy goes, no, no, I didn't forget, right? I didn't forget. And uh, he goes, oh, so you have something special for Mom. You know, it's a very, it's a, it's a big, big thing to do something for the woman that you love, the people that you love. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, yeah, I raised that boy good. <laughs> You know, I'm in the back. I'm kind of enjoying the conversation. And, you know, Andy's like, well, I've been really busy, so I haven't quite, you know, done anything yet. So my son begins to list all the things that he could do and how he could help him to accomplish that. Now, guys, I'm sitting in the back. I have this 19-year-old son who's talking to his father like that. I couldn't receive a better Valentine's gift than that, right? I just think this is wonderful. This is wonderful. In the discussion, I felt so valued. I felt recognized. And, you know, I felt like I was the most important woman in the whole world, right? And so I really have uh, thought about that conversation, you know, that they had. I've thought about it often. It almost nourished my soul this week. And so I was thinking that I must at the core of my being really needed to be loved, right? Well, I've been praying for our message and our series coming up, and I felt the Father says to me, Sharon, at the core of every person's being, they need to be loved. People need to be loved. And so being loved is so very important, not just to receive it, but to also give it. And we can only do that in the context of community, being in community with people. And so love is a very, very powerful concept. And when it's put in the hands of our Father God, right, when it's put in his hands and followed by the guidelines he puts out for us, it can change our world because it changes us. Right. So for the next six weeks, we are going to look at a series called The Power of Love. And today, Andy and I want to start that conversation with you with what matters most, what matters most in your life. Now, will you bow your heads with me? And I'm going to just ask the Holy Spirit to come more. Mm. Father, I pause for you. And I make room for you, Holy Spirit, that you may come into every corner of this auditorium, Lord God. You brought every person that's sitting here. It is by no mistake that they are here, Lord. They might have got drug in here today um, for Valentine's Day. But Father says that he had a seat with your name on it. And he has been waiting for you to come. And say, Father, I thank you for each and every soul that is in this room. And I ask, Lord, that your mighty love that your mighty love would break through whatever barriers that might be erected to you this morning, that they would come down in the name of Jesus, and that we would begin to know and to experience the power of your love, Lord, that can transform us 
that can make us into something that is so much bigger than we could ever accomplish by ourselves. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd come right now and just, yeah, just deluge us like a water just falling over each and every person, Lord. Open their ears. Help them to be attentive to what your Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, I want to start this morning teaching by telling you a story that Jesus told in the Bible, in the New Testament, in Luke 12. Now, I didn't put it in your outline, so you can write it down and go back and look at it later if you like. It's Luke 12, starting at verse 16, and this is what it says. There was a rich man whose lands produced bountiful harvest. He asked himself, what should I do? For I don't have enough space for the goods to store up all these goods. Then he said, the man... Here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build up, the lar- and build up larger ones. Then I can stay- say to myself, I have so many good things stored up for me, I can now rest, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your night will be demanded of you, and then to whom will all these things belong to? Thus, Will it be for anyone who stores up treasures for himself but is not rich in what matters the most? Is not rich in what matters the most. Now, I tell you that story because I believe that the world is always trying to get us to look uh, at the outside, that it will bring us happiness, that's what matters, you know, that possessions, prestige, power, these are the things that matter. And so most of us, if we're not careful, can run our whole lives trying to go after those, but that's not what it's not what God cares about. That's not what matters to him. In this story, we see where this uh, this guy, right, he's being so blessed. God has really poured out his favor, and so he's got all these crops and stuff. And instead of looking at it and thinking, well, maybe God's blessing me so I can bless other people, he decides to tear down what he already has, an adequate facility, and to make a bigger one, right? He's getting more uh, mini storage so he can put more of his, his blessings in there. Yet, it didn't go through his mind that perhaps God wanted him to give to the less fortunate. You know, he was too busy about his retirement. He's too busy about his 401k, right? He's, he's too busy storing it up. And then he's sitting back and he says, hey, I'm taken care of. I can eat, drink, and be merry. That's his attitude. And I think the life, you know, that we want to live and the life that the culture says, the culture says go after that to go after to have the most toys, you know, to have bigger houses and cars and a bigger portfolio and things like that. But God says, that's not what I want from you. He says, that's not what matters most. It's not. And so today I want to make sure that we align ourselves with what matters most. And in Galatians 5, 6, this is what the Father is saying to us today that matters to him. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, All that matters is, and you need to circle this, all that matters is your faith that makes you love others. Your faith that makes you love others. So it's what we're seeing here. It's not our accomplishment. It isn't our wealth, our fame. It's our faith that allows us to love others, right? Developing that. So that's something we need to make as the goal of our lives, to be able to to love. Now, that sounds so simple. (laughs) Love? Sure, we can love, right? Well, the art of loving The art of loving and the discipline of loving is something you have to go radically after. It's not something that just naturally happens. It's hard. Why? Because loving requires us to love people that are unlovable, right? That are really difficult. So what I'm saying is no small endeavor. It's huge. And because I know it is, I've asked my small groups if they would align themselves with us over the next six weeks so that They can run alongside of the concepts that we deliver here in this auditorium, that you could take them into those groups, into that faith community, that you can begin to talk about not just the concept of something like forgiveness, but how do I do that with the people I'm living with or the people I'm working with or going to school with, that you can take it and you can apply it in your life. You see, the application of that is going to require you to have some kind of a community around you to rally around you. Listen. I don't think any transformation in one's life happens outside of community. I think it's the people around us that rally us on, that talk to us on a daily basis, that help us to be able to mature in this love. You can't love in a vacuum. So I'm going to encourage you to be part of a small group, right, to be part of that community of faith. And if there's not one in existence that you like, then you grab two or three of your friends, and I will give you the curriculum (laughs) to do it yourself. 
You don't have to have a PhD to do this. It's simply understanding what's being given to you and then saying, how does that impact, you know, impact my life? What can I do with that? So I, my prayer for you is that you would get into community, that you can be transformed in this information I'm giving to you. Now, all of our, uh, all of our studies that we're going to do over the six weeks is taken from the love chapter. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 13, am I not? We hear that often referred to in weddings and stuff like that. Well, that's our love chapter, and I want to pull that in, and I want to talk to you about that uh, over the next six weeks, uh, myself and the teaching team of pastors. Now, here we go. Here's what I'm going to tackle in the next couple of minutes here is to show you something that I found in 1 Corinthians where uh, 13 verses 1, 2, and 3, there's this, this image that I see being portrayed in there. It's almost like waves. You know when they hit our shore in Virginia Beach, right? Shh, and then they go back out, and shh, they come back in. And there's like this rhythm that goes on. Well, I see that happening in 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 1, it starts there. And so I have these five waves that hit our shore, and they're repetitive because they want you to get the idea of what matters most. And so it's very repetitive so that we get it that we get it. So let's go and look at that real quick. These five statements that are built out of 1 Corinthians verses, uh, 13 verses 1, 2, and 3. The first one, if I don't live a life of love, right, nothing I say will matter. That's what goes in the blank. Nothing I say will matter. Here we go. Verse 1 says, if I could speak in any language in heaven and on earth, but I don't love others, I would only be making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging symbol. So basically, words without love is nothingness. It's empty. That's right, it's empty. Now you and I, we go and we listen to great speakers and they kind of tickle our ears, they might touch our emotions, and we might go, oh man, that's fantastic. What a good orator, what a good speaker. You know, and they motivate us and stuff. But God is not so much interested in how eloquently somebody might speak. Rather, he's interested in the heart of that person speaking. Do they love? Because he knows the principle that nothing I say matters if I do not have love. So that's the first thing we see in this, uh, this scripture. The second one is now here comes the next wave. If I don't live a life of love, look at this. Nothing I know, nothing I know will matter. And in verse 2 we see, I may have the gift of prophecy. I may understand all the secret things of God. I may have all knowledge. But if I do not have love, then I'm nothing then I'm nothing. So it's basically saying it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you, you know, have a PhD. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're like a brainiac, right? you got all the information on science and history and literature, right, and math. He said none of that matters, not at all. Brilliance without love equals zero, equals zero. Now I'm going to come at that because our world is exploding with information. I read a stat that says our information that we have around us is doubles every six years in our society. It doubles the amount of knowledge coming at us. So we're a smarter group of people than any generation that was, you know, preceded us or went behind us, right? And then went behind us. So what I want you to see though is though even though we are smarter, when I look at the world, I see the same problems. You know, I see those same old problems of terrorism and war and crime and abuse, of prejudice, of hatred, of violence. I see all that. Why? Because the world doesn't need more knowledge. It needs more love. It needs more love. So without love, nothing you say matters. And without love, nothing you know really matters. The next wave, shoo, that's coming ashore here in our lives, is if I don't live a life with love, nothing I believe will matter. Nothing I believe will matter. Now, there's a myth in Christendom that says it's all about just what you, what you say you believe in. You know, it's just what I believe. That's all that matters. And really, that's not true. <laughs> nothing can be further from the truth at all. It's not just about what you believe intellectually or have the right doctrine. That's not what it's about. It's about loving God with all your heart. It's about being passionate for him. That's what, that's what it's about to be a believer. Now, the Bible says, even if I have the gift of faith so I could speak to a mountain and make it move, in other words, I can move in the miraculous, right? I would still be worth nothing at all without love. You see, it takes more than just believing in God. And I know you're going, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Sharon. Wait a minute, I say I believe in Jesus. Isn't that enough? 
No, because even the devil will say that. Even the devil believes in God and believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God. But you won't see them in heaven. You won't see them there because it takes more than just believing. It takes loving him. It takes giving your whole heart to him. Now, the Bible says this. If I say I love God and hate other people, I'm a liar. What? Yeah. The Bible says if I love God and I hate other people, then I'm a liar. And so there's this connection here, relational connection that I want you to see. And then the Bible also says I can't say that I'm right with God and be out of sorts with other people. Relationships with others affect my relationship with God. If I don't live a life of love, nothing I believe will matter. Nothing. Those are so profound. You could sit and think about those forever. It really talks about the shore slapping upon our hearts, about the importance of love. It's more than what I say. It's more than what I believe. It's more than what I know. I must have love permeate everything. It is the foundation of everything. Now, here you go. Here's another wave coming at us. If I don't live a life of love, nothing I give will matter. Nothing I give will matter. It says here in the scriptures, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, but I didn't love others, I would be, it would be of no value whatsoever. So even though you might be a big giver of different things or sacrifice yourself, give your time, energy, money, if you don't do it out of love, then it doesn't count. It doesn't count in God's kingdom. Now, I would hope you would know that you can give, you know, you can give with the wrong kind of motives, right? We can give because if I give to you, I know you're going to give it back to me. That's called selfishness. And a lot of us have to work ourselves out of that, don't we? I'm going to be kind to you because I know you're going to be kind to me. I'm going to give you this because you're going to give it back. One of my favorite things on this to point this out is if you watch The Big Bang. No? Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Well, Sheldon. I hate when people give me because I got a last penny, got to give back to them, right? It's this idea of I give to you because I know you're going to give back to me. And so we need to really be careful with that and not let that overtake us. Also, I have found that other reasons people will give is not just I'm going to give back, but they want to um, pay for something in the past. You know, if I give enough and I give and I give and I give, then I can somehow atone for some mistakes that I've made in the past. And that doesn't help because only Jesus Christ can forgive. Giving to other people out of that is the wrong motive. And so just don't do it. We give in love. That's what counts. And then the last wave I want to show you that's happening in this 1 Corinthians 13 chapter is it says here, if I don't live a life of love, then listen, nothing I accomplish will matter. Nothing I accomplish will matter. Now, I like the way the message paraphrases this. It says, no matter what I say or what I believe or what I do, I am bankrupt without love. I am bankrupt. I'm nothing without love. So it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of, what kind of things you rack up about your personal accomplishments. You know, I am this. I've accomplished that. You know, even if you got your face in, in uh, the Virginia Pilot, or the Fortune 500 companies, or whatever. It doesn't matter if you're the greatest entrepreneur that ever walked the face of the earth, right? And you earn lots of money. It doesn't matter. All that the Bible says is worth squat, nothing, unless you have love. And so what you want me to hear, hear me say, and what you hear the Holy Spirit saying, is that what matters most to God is the relationships that we have. It's the relationships, not the accomplishments that matter. And in summarizing those ways when they come over, let me tell you, you and I, one day, 100% with guarantee, we're going to die. And we're going to stand before the Lord, and he's going to ask us, what do we do with the one and only life that he has given us? How did we live it? And I can guarantee you that he's not going to evaluate us on our bank accounts, how many houses we owned, what kind of car we drove, you know, what kind of grades we made in school, what kind of trophies do we have you know, from any kind of a sporting event or what. He's not going to ask us those things. Instead, what he's going to do is he's going to look at us and he's going to say to us, what did you do with the relationships that I gave you? What did you do with those? You see, the Father wants you to know the most important thing that matters to him is that you learn to love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with every breath that you have to breathe. You learn to love him And then you love your neighbor as yourself. 
So this is a great commandment. What is that neighbor part? I get the God part, but what's the neighbor part? The neighbor part is the person sitting right next to you. It's your spouse. It's your kids. It's your coworkers. God indeed has placed you right where you're at so that you can make a difference in their lives. And the primary thing that he's looking for you and I to do is to be able to, to understand the importance of love. The Bible says it very clearly that love is the primary objective of our life. Love is the primary objective of our life, and it should be the supreme value that we have. It should be our greatest power. And so we want to spend the next six weeks really uh, salting that and, and allowing it to, you know, to go down deep. And as I showed you, even the opening of our 1 Corinthians 13, it's like this wave that keeps hitting your heart because it wants to soften your heart. It wants to soften it so that you will always remember what's the most important thing that the Father wants from us, and he wants you to love. All right, I'm going to pass that to Andy, who's going to tell us about what love is. Okay, I'm excited about doing this uh, series on love. Uh, I think it's uh, the most important thing. Uh, you know, when we, we use love a lot, when we, in our language, we don't have the nuances that you see like in the Greek, which the Bible was written in Greek, the New Testament was. And so we'll often just say the words like, uh, uh, you know, I love my country, I love God, I love my spouse or my kids, I love pizza, I love spicy foods, I love my dog. And we just kind of throw it all in there. And um, even though there's different, different uh, valuations with that. And, and so, you know, what is love? Sometimes we're not sure about that. So I decided to go to the source of sources that I normally go to. It's is Google. And here's, <laughs> here's what Google said. Google says, uh, as a verb, it says, uh, it's deep, love is deep romantic or sexual attachment to somebody. I thought, well, that makes sense. And, you know, I mean, most people, that's what they think of with love is, is that it's sex. It's associated with sex. And, and, uh, and, and they think, well, I know a lot about that. And middle schoolers, they think they know a lot about sex. And high schoolers do. And everybody seems to be an authority. But, but love is really what the Bible talks about love is different than what the world often thinks about love. It's for, for when we think of uh, love songs, uh, we think of uh, uh, most love songs really are about sex, and it's more, more, a lot of it is about what I can get, you know, give me, give me, give me, I need, I need, I need, hey baby, if you don't give it to me, you know, I'm going to get it somewhere else, and, and that, that, that's really more about lust, really, because love is about giving, in other words, I want to give to you, it's not about what I can get out of this, that's, it's what I can give, if, if a guy says to you girls you're, that you're dating, if you love me, you'll let me, that's really lust. You should respond, if you love me, you'll wait. Yeah. You know, because we're, that's the difference between love and lust. And, our, and the world mostly knows about getting, I, what I get. That's when, and, that's, and that's how I register my love feelings. Where the Bible talks about love as being something we give. So we're going to look at this over the next six weeks. We're going to learn together. I can learn a lot as well. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and, and we're going to try to practice love. So what is love? Well, let's look at a few things just as we get off, uh, at, at, you know, the start here at the series. First of all, love is a command. Now, it's not optional. The Bible says we're, in, we're sinning if we don't love, and it's something that we're, God says, I want you to love one another. Second John 1 6 says, love means doing what God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another. You might say, well, I can live without love. Well, no, you can exist without love. You can't, you can't, you can't lo live without love because that's what, that's what pleases God. That's what we were made to do is just to, to love. And so we need that in our life. We need that. And because it's commanded, the corollary is, is that it's not a feeling because we can't, we can't command feelings. We can't make, us, make ourselves feel a particular way. You know, that's like controlling the wind. It just happens. You know, our feelings just happen. Have you ever tried to, uh, work with a, like a toddler who's all upset. They're not feeling good. They're upset. They, something didn't go their way. They're crying. They're screaming. And then you go, you go I command you to be happy. <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? You just can't do that. And you can't do that to other people too. I mean, who are, who are not toddlers, you know? They're like toddlers in big form, you know? 
I command you to be. No, because we, feelings, just they happen. God commands us to love because it's something we can control. Something that's not a feeling. It might cause feelings, but love in and of itself is more than a feeling. And so it's something worse to do. Number two is, is love is a choice. We can choose to love. We can choose not to love. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 in the message paraphrase says, go after a life of love as if your life depended on it because it does. So circle that, those words, go after. It's a volitional act. You decide to do it, which destroys another myth about love, that love is uncontrollable. You know, this idea that I just fell into love. It's like you're walking along and you fall into a ditch. You know, I just, I can't get out. And this idea of love is uncontrollable. I just can't control it. You know, today is Valentine's Day. And uh, the symbol, one of the symbols of Valentine's Day is Cupid. You know, Cupid goes all the way back centuries and centuries to classic G Greek mythology. Cupid was, uh, according to the, the, the mythology, is the son uh, he's a god, but he was birthed out of uh, Venus, who is the goddess of love and, uh, and erotic love, and, uh, and Mars, who's the god of war. I guess when war and love come together, you get Cupid. I don't know how that works. but <laughs> and, and he used to be depicted as a slender youth with wings. And then somewhere along the line, his, he, he, got, he got himself a hold of this bow and arrow, you know, that kind of symbolizes his, his, his superpower, I guess, is what we'd call it today. And then over the centuries, he, he just, he transformed into a chubby baby. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> if you find out, let me know. I, was, I couldn't find it. Just, but he's a chubby baby now. So. And if you get hit by one of these arrows of Cupid, you're smitten with, with love. You can't help it, right? It's just like, it happens uncontrollably. Now, that is a myth. Because real love, we can control it. You, we can choose to love somebody. I hear it quite a bit. People that say, well, I'm done with my marriage. You know, I'm, it's, it's over. You know, I mean, the separate, we're getting separated. We're getting divorced because I don't love her anymore. I don't love them anymore. Well, let's be honest. You're choosing to not love them. Because you can love somebody even if they don't love you back. You can love because love is not dependent on somebody else's behavior. That's why God loves us. He's not dependent on how we feel, on what we do, how we respond. God loves us regardless of how we treat him, how we treat others. He, he loves us. That's his grace. And that's, that's what love is. And so we choose to love or we choose not to love. But it is our choice. Number three, love is a conduct. It's a way of acting, an action. It's something we do. 1 John 3, 18 says, let us stop just saying we love people. You hear that plenty. That was 2,000 years ago. You still, oh, I love you, I love you. Let us really love them and show that by our actions. So there's a difference between saying you love somebody, that sentimentality that you get in a Hallmark card or American greetings card, and then actually doing it. Saying, I'm going to love you. And it goes beyond just what I say. I mean, it's a real action. Reminds me of the three pastors. They were, they were really close friends. They decided to go out fishing together, and uh, they're off on their boat pretty far away from shore. And in a moment of vulnerability, one of them just says, you know what, why don't we just share with some of the things we're currently struggling with? You know, just, you know, nobody else n needs to know, but just let's be vulnerable. So, what, so he goes, I'll start. I, he goes, I struggle with, with lying. I, I, I don't always tell the truth. I've struggled with that for a while. I make up things. I feel bad about it, but I still, I struggle with lying. And so the next pastor goes, okay, well, I'll, I'll share. He goes, tell you the truth, I struggle with lust. You know, I've had a problem in, for that with that for a while, and I struggle with lust, and I lust, and it's kind of embarrassing, but it's something I'm still working through. And so the last pastor goes, well, you don't want to have, to, you don't want to hear what I have to, I struggle with. They go, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, we're talking honestly with one another. What are you struggling with? He goes, ah, you don't want to know. He goes, yes, yes. They go, we do. He goes, well, I struggle with gossip, and I can't wait to get off this boat. <laughs> now, that's not a loving thing to do, right? You can choose. And we, we make excuses why we do what we do, why we act the way we act. 
But we can control it. We can control how we act to other people, right? If you might say, yeah, but the person I'm, I live with is they're so hard to get along with. You know, they're, they're, they're mean. <laughs> One guy was asked, he goes, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? He goes, I usually let her sleep in. <laughs> <laughs> We choose how we're going to respond. You know, we get to, am I today, am I going to be a loving person or am I going to not be? And we get, we get, to, cho- we get to choose that. Number four is, is love is a commitment. It's a commitment. First John 4, 16 says, God is love. If we keep on loving others, we will stay one in our hearts with God and he will stay one with us. So he's talking about here, that it's, there's a relationship that's involved, not just with God, but with other people. And if we stay, if we love other people, then we're one, in, one with God. And notice he says, keep on loving. In other words, it's durable. It keeps on keeping on. It's like the Energizer Bunny. It just goes on and on and on. You go, well, my love runs out. Well, human love does run out. People take advantage of us. People don't return love. It's only a matter of time until we just don't have anything else to give. But that's the difference between human love and God's love. That's the difference between depending on our own abilities and when we allow God to work through us. When we let God come and refresh us and renew us. And we invite the Holy Spirit to come into our life and say, God, I want your loving presence in my life so that I operate not just out of my my own abilities, but out of your overflow. You let God love on you. You know, it's one thing to just say, yeah, I am to get it. God loves me. And to get it, head knowledge. But you know, there's a big, you know, the biggest distance of all is between your head and your heart. Right. Getting it, feeling God's love, knowing, knowing God loves me. And God's forgiven me and God's shown that to me. And so out of that, see, I love other people. Now, when we study this over the next six weeks together, let me just tell you up front, you will have opportunities to love people, to love people who are not easily loved. Because mature love is always tested. It's always tested. See, sometimes people think, oh, I've got this, okay, I'm, 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 I know how to love people. But a lot of times we discover our love is shallow. Let me tell you, that's true with me. As I've thought about this, as we've been preparing for this series, I've come to the conclusion, yeah, I've, I have shallow love and God's got to grow that in me. That's something, that I, it's just a confession. You just need to know that, that I'm, I, I'm, I, I need to grow in this area. Maybe you have it all together, I don't know. If, in fact, I could learn from you. If you, have, if you don't need to learn about mature love anymore, you've got that nailed down. Would you please stand up? I want to I know who you are. <laughs> I think we all can grow, right? And God will test us. He's going to test mature love. And he'll give us that opportunity and we can do it. Let me give you a few things and we'll close. Just to kind of to be thinking about and to start to do as we launch this series together. Number one this is learn how mature acts and, and responds. Well, in other words, to, to be willing to have a new paradigm, a new perspective. And say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shelve my view of love for a little bit. And I want to learn what God has to say about love. Number two, start your day with a daily reminder of love. In other words, each day you kind of, kind of recalibrate, refocus and say, God help me to be loving because each day you'll get an opportunity to be, lo- to be loving. If you see it, if you have time, a lot of times we're just so busy or we get so frustrated, but it'll happen every day you'll have a chance to express love. And then in that moment when you're in conflict or there's some kind of uh, 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 challenging person in front of you, Instead of just reacting like you've always reacted, you can reflect and say, you know what, I started this day differently. Mm -hmm. And what you do the first 10 minutes of your day really sets the stage for the rest of your day. If you just get up, you flip on the news, and you just just pump in all that bad news, and you you have to set the stage. You have to choose. The first 10 minutes of the day, I'm going to decide how I'm going to, I'm going to set the stage for the rest of the day. That's number two. Number three is to practice acting in unselfish, loving ways. Sharon talked about that. We choose to be unselfish. We say, you know what? I want to do that. Now, the thing is, is we all are, we, if, if we're not 
used to that, then it feels unnatural to be loving because it feels so easy to just be the way we've always been. And so learning mature godlike love is something we grow into. Some people think, well, you know, yeah, I'm born a lover. No, no. You're born what you think is love, but we grow and mature by, de by decision, it, the way God wants us to grow. It's like driving a car. When you first started driving a car, you know, it's awkward. It feels weird. You got to move the seat and the mirrors and the parallel parking and the turns. And at first, it's like really hard. You're going, this feels really weird and awkward. And now, of course, it's second nature, right? You, could, you can text while you drive and <laughs> you can answer emails and put makeup on. <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying you could, right? And it's that easy. And that's what love is like. You grow into that as you start to do it, as you start to practice it. You go, okay, this feels, this feels more like it's the way I was made to be. And the number four, get support from other loving people. That's why we do our connect groups. That's why we're going to be studying love over the next six weeks. It's something we, we've discovered that together we can do a lot more than we can just do on our own. Just trying to do it on our own. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. And so that's why God gives us one another so we can learn together. I love this verse in Ephesians 5 too. Keep company with God and learn a life of love. That's what we're doing over these six weeks. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something back, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. That's a high calling, right? He says love like that, which is why we need to be more like God. We, that's what Jesus did. You see him, he got up, he recalibrated himself. He would spend some time in prayer. He would refocus and, 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 and dial in so that he would be loving. He would do all of these things and and that's why that, you know, that phrase, what would Jesus do, is, is irrelevant. It's irrelevant what Jesus would do for you if you're not doing what Jesus did. Right. Jesus started his day with prayer. He started his day refocusing his life. If you're not going to spend some time in prayer, then that, 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 that phrase is, 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 is not helpful. And so that's why it's so important that we, that we do these things. Okay, I want to do... I want to live, I want to do the things Jesus did, so I need to live like Jesus lived, which means it started out with, with prayer, refocusing my mind, being loving, surrounding myself around with people who can help me with that. This last verse says there in 1 Corinthians 13, in this life we have three lasting qualities, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why is, why is love greater than faith and hope? Well, because love is what lasts forever. You know, I mean, you have faith, which is vital today, but in heaven, you'll have the presence of God. You won't need faith then. Hope is so important today, but all your needs will be met in heaven, so you won't need hope then. But love is something you have forever because God is love. And even in the presence of God, we'll be surrounded with love. That's why love is so, so vital. It is what matters most. So let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Our prayer teams can come forward and we'd love to be able to pray for you. Some of you need a touch from the Holy Spirit. You need a touch from God because the truth is human love wears out. You need God to come alongside you and help you. So let's pray. Father, I am excited about what you're going to do over these next six weeks to develop us, to mature us, to take us out of shallow love into a more deeper understanding of love. Help us, Lord, to work that like we would work muscles. Teach us, Lord, to be loving in our relationships, in the people we work with, in our careers, with our families, our friends. Right now, Lord, I know that there's some people who desperately need you. They need you. Some of you are here, you're upset. You're, you've been hurt. And you're having a hard time dialing in to love. Those loving feelings aren't there. And that's why we're not really talking about loving feelings. Though. The feelings may come. I, maybe, I hope they do, I guess. But what is really important is that you act loving. That you do that because you, it's a choice you make. It's a commandment you fulfill. God says, I want you to be loving. Some of you are here and you're, you look at your future and it's scary. It fills you with anxiety. 
some of the relationships you're in. You have worry, you have stress. All of that is a sign that God's loving presence has not, has not filled your heart. You might, have set, you might have invited Christ into your life years ago. But when you are filled with anxiety and worry and fear, the Bible says in God's love, there's no fear. That anxiousness, that worrisome, that, that, that is an indicator light on the dashboard of your life saying, it's time to let God in. It's time to invite his presence in right now. Do that. Just say, Jesus Christ, come, Lord. Call my fears, call my anxieties, my worries. You say there's no fear in love. Teach me what that means. Teach me to walk each day with a mindset of not what I can get from people, but how I can give. Not dependent on how other people treat me, but that I can treat them in loving ways. Would you say, God, help me to learn how to act and respond in a way that reflects who you are making me to be. Let me be surrounded with loving people. If you're not in a support group, in a, in a connect group, maybe that's a place to start. Say, God, it's time for me to, to be part of a group of people that can encourage me and I can draw from, strength from. If you've never put your faith in Christ, why not do that? Say, Jesus Christ, I trust you. I want to walk with you. Help me in that decision. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I invite you to come up and receive prayer. We'd love to pray for you. Stand with you. If you're in a challenge, maybe you're in a, in a tough situation, maybe you're still struggling with some stuff, let us partner with you in prayer, okay? God bless. Thanks for coming.